Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next installment of our Declaration of Independence Signer series as we're taking a look at Thomas Lynch Jr. Part 2 today of our look at Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Part 1 yesterday. Uh, some very interesting things. Of course, we learned about the early life, the very uh, well-off and very wealthy and affluent early life of Thomas Lynch Jr. and his early education, going over to England and studying law. Like pretty much all of the South Carolina declaration signers seemed to do when they were in their younger years uh, going through their education. So now in part two, we're going to take a look at the signing of the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Lynch Jr., the, uh, the death of his father, Thomas Lynch Sr., and then, of course, his untimely death uh, where he was lost at sea. So we're going to get into all of this sort of thing in part two here today. So uh, let's just jump right in. Let's dive right in. Part two. Our next installment of this Declaration of Independence Signer series, taking a look at Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina. Here we go. The health of the younger Thomas Lynch Jr. soon after joining Congress began also to decline with the most alarming rapid pace. He continued, however, his attendance upon that body until the Declaration of Independence had been voted and his signature affixed to that important instrument. He then set out for Carolina in company with his father, who had hitherto been detained by feeble health in Philadelphia, but the father lived only to reach Annapolis when a second paralytic attack terminated his valuable life. After this afflicting event, the son proceeded to Carolina, but such was his own enfeebled state of health that he had little reason to anticipate the long continuance of life. A change of climate in the view of his physicians and friends presented the only hope of his ultimate recovery. A voyage to Europe was at that time eminently hazardous on account of exposure to capture. A vessel, however, was found proceeding to St. Eustatia, on board of which, accompanied by his amiable and affectionate wife, he embarked, designing to proceed by a circuitous route to the south of France. From the time of their sailing, nothing more is known of their fate. Various rumors were from time to time in circulation concerning the vessel in which they sailed, but their friends, after months of cruel suspense, were obliged to adopt the painful conclusion that this worthy pair found a watery grave during some tempest which must have foundered the ship in which they sailed. Although the life of Mr. Lynch was thus terminated, at an early age, he had lived sufficiently long to render eminent services to his country and to establish his character as a man of exalted views and exalted moral worth. Few men possessed a more absolute control over the passions of the heart and few evinced in a greater degree the virtues which adorn the human mind. In all the relations of life, whether as a husband, a friend, a patriot, or the master of the slave, he appeared conscious of his obligations and found his pleasure in discharging them. That a man of so much excellence, of such ability and integrity, such firmness and patriotism, so useful to his country, so tender and assiduous in all the obligations of life, should have been thus cut off in the midst of his course and in a manner so painful to his friends is one of those awful 
dispensa dispensations of him whose way is in the great deep and his, whose judgments are past finding it. I should say finding out is how that sentence ended, not finding it. And of course, it's very religious. It has a very religious overtone, that last uh, paragraph there. Um, and, you know, again, he was a slaveholder. Uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit here. Uh, so, you know, it talks about how he took great pride in, uh, you know, dealing out the uh, being the master of the slave. Uh, so, again, we take it all with somewhat of a grain of salt uh, due to the time period. Doesn't excuse it. Uh, that's it's not an excuse in any way, shape or form. Uh, we just look at the times and the era and all the history and all the facts that we can have surrounding it. We draw our own conclusions about these gentlemen and these people. Um, but yeah, he was a slave holder, and we will definitely get into that in more depth in a little bit. The great expectations of Thomas Lynch Jr. were quashed when they reached Annapolis, Maryland. His father was struck with another paralytic attack, which caused his death. Thomas continued his trip to South Carolina, but his health continued to deteriorate alarmingly. And upon his return, there was much trepidation among his friends concerning his life. He was urged to leave South Carolina to escape the torrid climate of Charleston and through a more moderate climate regain his health. The advice came not only from friends, but also his doctors. Nonetheless, a voyage to France was at the time a dangerous challenge and the possibility of capture by the British was high. In an attempt to lessen the odds of failure, Thomas Lynch Jr. and his wife Elizabeth set sail on a vessel going to St. Eustatia. And from there, they intended to board a neutral vessel to carry them to Europe. After the ship embarked, it was spotted a few days out at sea. But afterward, it vanished without a trace. It is thought that the vessel was lost to a storm while en route to the West Indies during 1779. Lynch's mother, Elizabeth Austin Lynch, succumbed during 1755 while Thomas was still a child. His father, subsequent to the death of Elizabeth, remarried, taking Hannah Mott as his second wife. Thomas Sr. and Hannah had one child, Elizabeth. Hannah Mott Lynch, subsequent to the death of Thomas Sr., married Colonel William Moultrie during 1779. Also, Thomas Jr. and Elizabeth had no children, but prior to their departure from South Carolina, he had taken the precaution to draw up a will which enabled his three sisters, Sabrina and Esther, from his father's first marriage and Elizabeth from his father's second marriage, to inherit his estate. The family plantation, Hopsawee Plantation, where Thomas Lynch Jr. was born, remains in existence and under private ownership, but it is open to the public. While young Lynch had been in military service, his father Thomas Sr. was in Congress. Early in 1776, the father suffered a stroke that severely limited his ability to serve effectively. Despite his own fragile health, the son was also sent to Philadelphia as a delegate. There was little for him to do but sign the declaration before the state of his father's health made an immediate return to South Carolina imperative. The ailing father and son began the long homeward journey, but only one of them completed it. Thomas Lynch Sr. died at Annapolis, Maryland, hundreds of miles from his home, and his son had no choice but to bury him there. The rest of the story is brief. The young man's health grew steadily worse. In 1779, he and his wife set sail for the West Indies, hoping to change ships there for the healthier climate of southern France. What happened, we will never know, for their ship disappeared completely without a trace or a survivor. 
Thus, Thomas Lynch, a signer of the Declaration of Independence at 27, was dead at 30. It is sad that he had so few years and so little health with which to enjoy America's independence. On March 23rd of 1776, the General Assembly of South Carolina, organized under the Constitution, which he had operated in drafting, elected Thomas Lynch Jr. to the Continental Congress so that he might care for his father, who was in Philadelphia and had suffered a stroke. Thomas Lynch Jr. was now also too incapacitated to continue in public service, but was present at the vote for the adoption of the Declaration of Independence on July 2nd. And he signed the engrossed document on August 6th of 1776, three days before his 27th birthday. Uh, genealogy, we know he was born, obviously, Hopsawee Parish, or uh, Hopsawee Plantation in St. George's Parish. Um, he married Elizabeth Shubrick. They didn't have any children. Um, she was the daughter of Thomas and Mary Baker Shubrick of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, May 11th of 1779, Thomas Lynch of Santee made his will in which he mentions his wife Elizabeth, sister Sabina, Esther, and Elizabeth Lynch. Also Mrs. Lynch, widow of my late honored father and others. Sister Sabina Lynch during her life, then to her eldest son when of age, and if failing to have a son, then to sisters Esther and Elizabeth in like manner. Person who shall be entitled to take the said plantation under under and by virtue of this will, shall take and use the surname Lynch and no other. It having been my father's intention, and it being my meaning to limit a part of his estate, as far as the law will permit, to such of his family, as shall use the surname of Lynch. Executors to move body of my father from Annapolis, and to be interred in the parish churchyard at Santee, with a plain marble monument erected in the hope of improving his health. Nope. To be erected. I'm sorry. Read the wrong uh, one there. Oh, I didn't read the wrong one. In the hope of improving his health, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Lynch Jr. took passage for the West Indies in the late autumn of 1779, expecting to board a vessel there to travel to the south of France. The ship on which they sailed was never heard of again, and it is supposed that all its passengers were lost. Thomas Lynch Jr.'s nephew, John Lynch Bowman, changed his name to John Bowman Lynch. He was the only son of John and Sabina Lynch Bowman. John Bowman Lynch had three sons and four daughters. All three of the sons were killed in the Confederate service during the Civil War. They left no descendants. Uh, talks a little bit about the Alston line. Thomas Lynch um, was born in St. James Parish in Berkeley County, South Carolina. He married first on September 5th of 1745, Elizabeth Alston, who was the mother of Thomas Lynch Jr. And he married second on March 6th of 1755 at Georgetown, Hannah Mott, by whom he had three daughters. Uh... Elizabeth Alston was the daughter of William Alston, collector of customs for Georgetown. And it just kind of goes on a little bit deeper here. Hannah Mott was the fourth daughter of Jacob Mott, uh, the Huguenot ancestor of the family who was the treasurer of South Carolina. Um, yeah, it, it, that's pretty much it as far as like genealogy, kind of an overview. But I find it interesting that it said right supposedly in Thomas Lynch Jr.'s will that his father's body was to be, uh, he was in Annapolis and to be moved and interred at Parish Churchyard at Santee uh, with a plain marble monument. Um, interesting, because now I'm going to have to look into that a little further. Cut loose from his other political chores, the dutiful son scampered to Philadelphia to tend to his father. The Lynches were the only father-son team serving in Congress at the same time. 
but it seems clear that Thomas Sr. did not do much in Congress following his stroke. Though Thomas Jr. had been exposed to malaria during military service in South Carolina and was himself sick, he still managed to monitor the debates in Congress throughout that long, hot, humid summer. And that night, he hurried back to their Philadelphia flat and briefed his ailing father on the events of the day. Ultimately, Thomas Jr. and his fellow delegates, the rich and titled men who might have seemed unlikely to vote for independence, voted for and signed the declaration. The elder Lynch was too sick to attend either event. In fact, if you look on the declaration, you'll see that a space was left between Rutledge's and Hayward's signatures for the eldest Lynch to sign. He never did. In fact, he died in Annapolis on the way home to South Carolina. His son, the replacement signer, was with him at the end. And his father's only son, he inherited his family's vast estate. You'd think the guy had it all. Wealth, looks, a pretty wife, productive lands, and numerous slaves to work them. But Thomas Jr. was still ill, and doctors suggested that he nurse himself back to health in a sunny locale. In 1779, at the age of 30, sickly Thomas embarked on a trip to the south of France by the way of the West Indies. He and Elizabeth boarded a ship in South Carolina and sailed down the east coast of America toward the Caribbean. It's believed that they got as far as modern-day Statia or Statia in the Netherlands Antilles. Their next ship to Europe most likely hit a storm because the two were never seen again. Thomas Lynch Jr., the second youngest signer, was also the youngest of all 56 men to be wiped off the face of the earth. Recently, the sad lives of the Lynches made modern-day news. In 2008, a gold morning ring believed to have belonged to Thomas Sr. surfaced at an antique show in Charleston. Morning jewelry was crafted at the behest of wealthy families to commemorate the death of loved ones. An inscription indicates that Thomas Sr. wore the ring to remember his wife Elizabeth, the mother of the signer. An Annapolis family had carefully preserved the precious object for 200 years, though no one knows how it came to be in their possession. Did Thomas Jr. offer the ring in lieu of payment for medical services for his ailing father who died in Annapolis? Or was the ring pilfered from the grieving son as he returned home after signing the declaration, as some believe. This mystery is lost to time, but fortunately the ring is not. Within two hours of the show's opening, it was purchased for an undisclosed, undisclosed five-figure sum by an anonymous buyer who vowed that the ring will never again leave the state of South Carolina. Though fate conspired to keep the lynches from dying on their native soil, perhaps father and son would have taken comfort in knowing that this family heirloom has finally returned home. When the first provincial regi regiment was raised in South Carolina in 1775, a captain's commission was accepted by young Mr. Lynch, and in company with C.C. Pickney, he made a recruiting excursion into North Carolina to raise the company he was to command. In this service, he was exposed to malarial mosquitoes and the fever, and his health received a shock from it never fully recovered. He raised his company and they joined his regiment, only to learn a few days later of the sudden and incapacitating illness of his father from a paralyzing stroke in Philadelphia which caused the father to resign his seat in Congress. The Provincial Assembly elected young Lynch to fill it, and he hastened to Philadelphia to take his seat in 1776. Lynch and his father thus had the unique distinction of being the only father-son team of representatives to the Congress. He supported the proposition for independence 
and impressed his colleagues with his earnest and eloquence. He, Lynch, voted for the Declaration, and on August 2nd of 1776, three days before his 27th birthday, he joined the other South Carolina delegates in signing the parchment, leaving a space between the signatures of Edward Rutledge and Thomas Hayward Jr. for an additional signature in the hope of the elder Lynch making enough recovery one day to also sign the document. The father's health only worsened. So father and son began a slow trip home, which got as far as Annapolis, Maryland, where the father, father died and was buried. When Thomas Lynch Jr. returned home from Philadelphia, he was a sick man. He retired from public life and lived at Peach Tree Plantation on the Santee River with his wife. The malingering fever contracted from his time in the military service continued racking his body into worsening health. Upon the advice of his doctors in 1779, he and his wife decided to travel to France with the hope that the therapeutic help there may restore his health. The war, with the possibility of his capture, made ocean travel even more dangerous. So they embarked for St. Eustatius in the West Indies to seek out a vessel to transport them to France. On this first leg of the long journey, their ship was last seen when it was but a few days out at sea. Presumably, presumably, it foundered during a storm and they both drowned. No one survived. Ship and passengers and crew all simply disappeared. Another mystery of the fabled Bermuda Triangle area. At age 26, he was among the youngest to sign the declaration. And at age 30, he was the youngest of the signers at their deaths. Having had no children, this signer has no direct descendants. Interestingly, his will made before the fateful journey includes provisions for his sisters and stepmother, but requires that no one would inherit Lynch land unless they shall take and use the surname Lynch and no other. It having been my father's intention and it being my meaning to limit a part of his estate as far as the law will permit to such of his family as shall use the surname Lynch. Mr. Lynch's nephew, John Lynch Bowman, later changed his name to John Bowman Lynch. He was the only son of the signer's sister, Sabina. John Bowman Lynch had three sons and four daughters. The three sons were all killed in Confederate service during the Civil War. Thomas Lynch was a man of many interests. His father, Thomas, gained notoriety for the development of a method of rice cultivation on coastal lands. Lynch continued this agricultural tradition by owning three working plantations. By 1774, he had received land grants totaling 10,512 acres, in addition to lands he inherited from his father's estate. And on these plantations, Lynch held over 250 slaves. Lynch also invested in shipping, being part owner in three trading ships. He also had an interest in education, serving as a member of the Charleston Library Society. This is Thomas Lynch Sr., by the way. So, regarding slavery, Thomas Lynch Sr. and Thomas Lynch Jr. definitely owned slaves. There was over 250 slaves that worked at their plantation, the Lynch's plantations. Uh, and of course, we're talking about the Hopsawee Plantation, where Thomas Lynch Jr. was born, the Peach Tree Plantation that Thomas Lynch Jr. Uh, owned and lived at. There were definitely slaves. Um, you're probably seeing some photos on your screen. These are uh, supposedly some slave quarters at Hopsawee Plantation there in Georgetown, South Carolina, uh, still to this day. So, uh, interestingly enough, there's some stuff there about that. Um, you know, just some photos and such. But definitely slave owners, over 250 total. 
Uh, but that could be combined between Thomas Lynch Sr. and Thomas Lynch Jr. Of course, his father died from a stroke in December of 1776. His mother later married another influential political figure, South Carolina Governor William Moultrie. And his sister, Sabina Hope Lynch, married James Hamilton. And one of their sons was James Hamilton Jr., who became governor in the state in 1830. Uh, of course, we know all about, you know, the different uh, things that happened leading up to the Declaration signing. Less than a month after signing the Declaration of Independence, Lynch threatened that South Carolina would secede from the United States in a threat representing the interest uh, of his constituents. If it is debated whether their slaves are their property, there is an end of the Confederation. That is a quote from Thomas Lynch Jr. Um, pretty interesting uh, stuff there, of course. He was the second youngest delegate in the Continental Congress when he filled in for his father's place. Uh, after signing the Declaration, an ill Thomas Lynch Jr. set out for home with his ailing father. And on the way to South Carolina, his father suffered a second stroke and died in Annapolis in December of 1776. Thomas Lynch Jr. retired in early 1777. After two more years of illness in South Carolina, where he resided with his wife at Peachtree Plantation on the South Santee River, many suggested that he travel to Europe and search for a different atmosphere. He and his wife sailed for respite on the Brigantine Polly to St. Eustatius in the West Indies on December 17th of 1779. The ship is known to have disappeared shortly after, standing as the last record of his life, and he and his wife were lost at sea. At age 30, he was the youngest signer of the Declaration of Independence to die. Before dying at sea, he made a will requiring that the heirs of his female relatives change their last name to Lynch in order to inherit his family estate. His sister responded by changing her name. She and her husband owned and managed the peach tree plantation until their son was of age. Their son, John Bowman Lynch, and his wife had three male children, of course. Uh, upon the death of Sabina, Thomas Lynch Jr.'s sister, the estate passed to Lynch's youngest sister, Amy Constance Deliard Drayton, in accordance with his will that the estate remain in the family. Lynch's birthplace was the Hopsawee Plantation. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1971. Autographs by Thomas Lynch Jr. are among the rarest of the signers. His time in Congress lasted less than a year, and much of this time was spent in poor health. Only a single letter has survived, along with a few signatures on historical documents. Many of his autographs have scattered, and others were lost in a fire. Today, Lynch's autograph sells for as much as $250,000. So, I found a little special guest to say a quick hello. Hello, Mr. Henry. Hello. How you doing? Good. Well, you got uh, great remarks and great reviews and praise for your introduction in part one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Pretty cool? Yes, thank you. Oh, of course. You did a very, very good job. Everybody uh, super impressed. So what do you think of this guy, Thomas Lynch Jr.? Kind of an interesting guy? Yes. Uh, you think it's kind of interesting? Lost at sea? No, no yeah. grave site to go visit? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, a few words you are uh, there, uh, Mr. Henry. But thank you for joining us and saying hello. You are welcome. And we'll see you soon. Yes. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So there you go, guys. That's pretty much going to do it. Uh, for this part two, a uh, look at the life, legacy, and untimely early death of Thomas Lynch Jr., signer of the Declaration of Independence from South Carolina, now listen, there is a little bit of bonus footage. No, of course, I didn't magically or uh, shockingly find the remnants of Thomas Lynch Jr. at the bottom of the Atlantic. Uh, it's nothing uh, earth-shattering like that. 
Uh, but it is kind of interesting little bonus footage I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, so stay tuned for that. A little bit of bonus footage. And then, of course, stay tuned next week. We got a lot going on. Our very last signer from the state of South Carolina, our last one for the state of South Carolina next week. And then next Thursday, February 16th, stay tuned for a very, very special live stream where I'm going to be interviewing um, two very, very special authors. So be on the lookout for my announcement uh, for that, that special live stream that's going to be announced on uh, my Instagram account very soon. So stay tuned for that next Thursday. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope everybody will join us and watch that. Uh, and that's pretty much it, guys. I hope everybody enjoyed this look at the interesting and unfortunate short life of Thomas Lynch Jr. from South Carolina. Thank you so much, guys, for everything. The likes, the subscribes, the comments, the questions, all of it. Henry and I cannot thank you enough. We really appreciate it. And stay tuned for a little bonus footage. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye now, guys. Hey guys, uh, so my audio did not record on these bonus videos, so I'm just going to kind of show you. Uh, what we're taking a look at first is actually St. Anne's Parish. Uh, it's a church, St. Anne's Church in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, this is supposedly where Thomas Lynch Sr. is buried. Uh, it's the St. Anne's Parish Church Cemetery in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, for those of you not familiar, Annapolis, Maryland is very famous here, uh, of course, for the Naval Academy. Uh, you're seeing on your screen now the shots of the church itself and the cemetery outside. Now, I looked high and low uh, to try to find a picture of Thomas Lynch Sr.'s tomb or gravestone, and I couldn't find anything. So I contacted St. Anne's Church and a very nice historian wrote me back and told me that they have no record and no plot information on Thomas Lynch Sr. So basically they don't know where he is in this church cemetery ground. Um, he's definitely there from what we know. Uh, that's at least what historians believe, and uh, they're pretty sure that is factual. Uh, but they don't know where in the cemetery grounds Thomas Lynch Sr. is, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I know a few years back, probably within the last 15 years or so, there was an archaeologist or a dig that happened in this church cemetery uh, churchyard here. Uh, and the, they actually found remnants of, like, other families that they didn't even realize were buried there, like other family plots. So, uh, clearly the record keeping was not so great when it came to uh, this church, uh, and especially back in that time period. Uh, you're seeing here on the screen some pictures of, like, the tombstones and some of the grave sites in the St. Anne's uh, Church Cemetery grounds. Unfortunately, none of these say Thomas Lynch Sr. None of these are his gravesite, uh, at least that we know of. And according to the historian at St. Anne's Church, they don't know where he is. They don't know where his grave actually is. So there you have that. Unfortunately, uh, not much I can show you in the way of uh, Thomas Lynch Sr.'s final burying place. Uh, but this is the St. Anne's Church, again, in Annapolis, Maryland, supposedly where Thomas Lynch Sr. is buried. Um, beautiful grounds, as you guys can see, kind of from the Google Earth here. Um, so, unfortunately, that's just kind of the way it is. Don't know uh, much else about it uh, other than supposedly he's somewhere in these grounds. Um now, as far as just to kind of give you perspective of where this is at, uh, you know, of course, St. Anne's Church is in Annapolis, Maryland, like I said, uh, right across the street from the Maryland State House, 
Uh, you can kind of see that on the Google Earth, the Maryland State House right across the street. Uh, and then the Naval Academy uh, is not far. Uh, you see where the red dot is. That's where St. Anne's Church is. And then, of course, the United States Naval Academy sits right there on the water. Uh, so very close. Uh, very, very nice, beautiful place, Annapolis, Maryland. Now moving on, here's another thing that was very cool. This is the St. John's Parish Church, I believe it's called. Uh, this is uh, St. James, I take that back. St. James Parish Church in South Carolina. Now this is the church that in Thomas Lynch Jr.'s will he said that he wanted his father to be uh, reinterred here at the Santee Parish Church. Now, take a look at this. It's on a dirt road, uh, deep, you know, kind of in the backwoods of South Carolina. There's this old church, and you'll see there is a cemetery there, and there is grave sites. Um, however, there's no record of Thomas Lynch Sr. being reinterred here. However, the other interesting fact is there is a historical marker that you can kind of see. It's a little blurred out. I'm going to show you photos after this. But that historical marker mentions Thomas Lynch as one of the first uh, people of this church and somebody who was uh, a part of uh, the group that built the church, basically, that basically, you know, created this church. So Thomas Lynch Sr. definitely was a part of this church. And this is where Thomas Lynch Jr. wanted his father to be reburied. He wanted him uh, taken from Annapolis and brought here, but there's no record of that. So I just kind of wanted to show you that. Uh, after the this bonus video, I'm going to show you photos of St. Anne's Church Cemetery in Annapolis, Maryland. And I'm going to show you photos here of this St. James um, Santee uh, Parish uh, so you can kind of just give a perspective of some of the photos of where Thomas Lynch Sr., uh, Thomas Lynch Jr.'s father, supposedly uh, is buried. Supposedly it's in Annapolis, but who knows? Maybe he was reinterred and he's somewhere in this churchyard uh, down in South Carolina, but not sure. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, there you have it, guys. Thanks so much. Hey guys, so uh, I wanted to take a look and show you kind of an idea of where Thomas Lynch Jr. probably uh, was lost at sea. So this is kind of a look at that St. Eustatia or Eustatius or Eustatius uh, area. This is the West Indies. You can see the U.S. Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands right there. And then there's St. Lucia and Barbados and all this stuff. Um... This is the West Indies. Uh, supposedly, he was headed there to St. Eustace. Or Eustace. Uh, and then uh, he was going from there. You can see all these different islands here. St. Lucia, Barbados, you know, right down there. Then supposedly he was going from there to the south of France, uh, which would have been kind of in a northeasterly direction across the Atlantic. Uh, kind of going to show you here. When I zoom out, uh, so there you go. You see, obviously, down where that red dot is, and then whoop, and then across the Atlantic uh, to the south of France. So he either was lost from South Carolina down to the West Indies, or he was lost from the West Indies, St. Eustace, uh, over to France. Um, it's not really clear which place he was lost at, but it's somewhere. Uh, in that general vicinity. Uh, so that's all the West Indies again that you're seeing. St. Eustace, 
British Virgin Islands, all that stuff. Now, um, he's probably, he could be right over in that general area is where the ship wrecked. Or it was over in the North Atlantic, the North Atlantic Ocean where the ship wrecked. Uh, that's if he made it from St. Eustace heading over to the south of France. Um, another thing I want to kind of show you guys, just so you can kind of get a perspective, an idea. Um, if you take a look up in South Carolina, so he probably left from Port somewhere in the Charleston area. You see Charleston there. You see the North Santee River, which is kind of to the right of Charleston. Uh, so he probably left from that general port area there in South Carolina. And then he basically, the supposedly, he headed due south past Florida, uh, past the Bahamas, uh, and then down to the West Indies to that St. Eustace uh, area. Um, now, who knows? It's basically a south, almost a straight, so, uh, straight shot south, kind of a southeasterly direction from South Carolina down to the West Indies. So I don't know if it was in that range that he died or if it was from the St. Eustace over toward uh, the south of France. So it's either in the general vicinity from South Carolina to the West Indies where you can kind of see my mouse is circling uh, and then, or in the North Atlantic. That's where Thomas Lynch Jr. Uh, perished, unfortunately. So there you go. Just kind of wanted to show you guys that, give you a little perspective on it. I uh, thought it was kind of an interesting thing. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of where, where it was at, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, hope you enjoyed this, guys. Thomas Lynch Jr. Thanks.